All right. Good morning. Thank you all so much for being here. It is so great to see everybody in the house of the Lord. We want to thank everyone who's here in person, and we want to give a special thanks to everyone tuning in live on Facebook. I especially want to give a shout out to my sister, Patsy Patton, who's watching. Thank you so much for everyone who's watching and for our online church members and church community. We welcome all of you, and we say thank you for joining us. We have a lot going on here at the church, and I hope that you came ready to praise the Lord. We've got a lot for you to know about. Make sure you check out this video, and then we're going to get our praise on. Amen? Thanks for being here. to Antioch. Let's take a look at what's going on. Don't forget, August 21st, there's a fishing tournament and gathering at Holiday Lake State Park. Baby dedication service will be August 22nd. Please contact the church office if you wish to have your child or infant dedicated on that day. Sunday, August 29th, during the first service, we will be having deacon ordination. Who needs a little revival? That's right, tent service is coming up. We'll be down at the Hardware River on September 23rd through the 26th. Time to start thinking forward. We'll be having the Fall Festival on October 30th. Looks like it's gonna be an epic time. More information to come. Think we missed something? We might have. Make sure to check that bulletin. Oh yeah, and don't forget, enjoy the service. Amen, amen. Let's get up on our feet. Before we go to the Lord, in uh, praise and worship this morning, I want to lead us in a special time of prayer for our children that are going back to school. Y'all can go ahead and stand up and pray with me. 
Um, and I want to let everybody know, uh, this Wednesday at 6 p.m., before the school board meeting at 7, I'm going to be leading a prayer circle right in front of the school board office. I want every single one of you that's able to come. We're going to gather outside of that place, and we're going to pray that the Lord would move on the hearts of the board members and on everybody who comes so that our children can go to school and be safe. Amen? Amen. And if the people of God don't stand up against this nonsense and this silliness, who will? We have a mandate now. We have an obligation to defend the defenseless. Amen? And to speak out for the image of God, for his model of creation, and for our children. Amen? Amen? So let's, would you join me in a word of prayer? Bow your heads with me. Teresa, you can start playing softly. Heavenly Father, we come to you now in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you for your word that says that children are a heritage from the Lord. We thank you, O oh God, for the blessing that we have in each and every one of our children and grandchildren. Lord, your word says that before they were formed in their mother's womb, that you knew them and you called them and you have a plan for them. So we pray over our county right now, Lord, you know the battles that we're facing when in regards to the public school system. We just pray in Jesus' name that you will move on the hearts of parents, of children, of administrators, and of school board members. So Lord, our, our young people can go to school and be safe and not be afraid of somebody coming in the wrong bathroom. Lord, that they would be able to focus on learning, that it would be an atmosphere where their, their minds are filled and nurtured and, and, and they learn the skills that they need so that they can be productive citizens in this country and, in, and abroad. Lord, we just pray a prayer of protection over each and every student. We pray that your ministering angels would guard them and surround them, Lord. Every elementary and middle and high, and high school and college student that's going. But we pray over all the staff, Lord. We know that many of the, of the teachers and administrators that are working as public servants in the public school system, they're your people. They're born again Christians, oh God. And we pray that, that you will be with them, that you'll strengthen them, give them the courage, give them the wisdom that they need, oh God, to thrive in this coming year. Lord, we don't know what decisions will be made, but we're trusting on you and we pray, oh God, that righteousness will prevail. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Let's worship. Better. 
here. Let's give it up for the Lord this morning. says, I exalt you, my God, the King, and praise your name forever and ever. I will praise you every day. I will honor your name forever and ever. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation will declare your works to the next and will proclaim your mighty acts. I will speak of your splendor and glorious majesty and your wonderful works. They will proclaim the power of your awesome acts, and I will declare your greatness. They will give a testimony of your great goodness and will joyfully sing of your righteousness. Church, let's proclaim the greatness of our God. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bonds will say, Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise.
for you, Lord. Lord, we wouldn't even woken up this morning, Lord, if your hand wasn't on us, Lord. Lord, we love you so much, Lord, but your love for us is more than we can even comprehend, Lord. Your love is so perfect, so relentless, Lord, so unending, Lord. And we're so thankful for that promise, God. And we love you. I pray over the congregation this morning, Lord. I pray that we'd each come to know you more and more every day, Lord. Grow us closer to you, Lord. And we love you, Lord.
Hallelujah. Our debt has been paid in full by the precious blood that Jesus spilled. That's really, really, really good news. Amen. And that's a fact that is essential. That fact, the redemptive power of Jesus Christ on the cross is an essential truth that has eternal implications on every single person that has ever drawn breath on this planet. That's the good news. Now I'm going to preach to you this morning about the reality of hell. And I'm going to give you some sobering truth. If you aren't exuberant and excited and overjoyed that the precious blood of Jesus Christ has covered you, but not only that, it has saved you. Saved you from what? Saved you from the reality of eternal damnation. If you're saved this morning, you should leave here burdened and you should leave here overjoyed. And if you're not saved, if you're just a church goer, if you're just a pew sitter, if you're just a nominally religious person, the only logical thing you should do this morning is cry out, Jesus save me. Jesus save me. And that blood that he shed on the cross can save you too. Amen? Open up in your Bibles to Luke chapter 16. If you're using the chair Bible or the pew Bible or whatever you want to call it, the pretty blue Bible, it's page 1049. This is one of the most sobering stories and truths that Jesus Christ ever shared while he was on the earth. Because he talked about the reality of hell. Starting in verse 19 of chapter 16. There was a rich man who would dress in purple and fine linen, feasting lavishly every day. Sounds like my kind of guy. But a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, was left at his gate. And he longed to be filled with what fell from the rich man's table. But instead, the dogs would come and lick his sores. One day, the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's side, also known as paradise. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, or hell, he looked up and saw Abraham a long way off with Lazarus at his side. Father Abraham, he called out, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this flame. Son, Abraham said, remember that during your life you received your good things just as Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here while you are in agony. Besides all this, a great chasm has been fixed between us and you so that those who want to pass over from here to you cannot. Neither can those from there cross over to us. Father, he said, I beg you to send Lazarus to my father's house because I have five brothers to warn them so they won't come to this place of torment. But Abraham said they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if anyone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. But Abraham told him, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. Heavenly Father, I pray for a supernatural anointing and awareness to the reality of hell, to the redemptive power of the cross 
that can save us from hell and take us to heaven. Lord, I pray you would shake every single person that hears this message to the core. If they're not saved, to run to you. If they are saved, to run to their neighbors, to their communities, to their family members, and to their co-workers and warn them about the reality of hell. But Lord, I pray that you would make it impossible for anyone to sit here or to sit at home and view this message or listen to this message and it not have an effect on the deepest parts of their soul. This reality is what should motivate every one of us, Lord, your children, to tell everyone we know about you. I pray it will have that effect. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. This morning, we look at the teaching of the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, teaching about the reality of hell. There's a lot of speculation about hell. There's also a lot of misinformation about hell this morning in Luke chapter 16 verses 19 through 31 we see a contrast between two people a rich man and a poor man named Lazarus this is the only time when Jesus told a story or a parable where he mentioned someone specifically by name these two men spent their time on earth in completely different ways and they spent their eternity in completely different places the rich man lived the good life with the biggest house on the biggest hill on the biggest side of town while Lazarus lived his life on the street and begged at the rich man's gate. The rich man feasted lavishly while Lazarus starved and longed to be filled with the scraps that fell from the rich man's table. The rich man partied extensively, surrounded by the rich and famous, one of the nation's top influencers. He was a top-tier man, drinking from the top shelf, living life at the highest level, while Lazarus only had the company of stray dogs who would come and lick the, sto the sores on his crippled and decaying body. But after they died, the rich man went to hell and Lazarus went to paradise. One went to Hades, which is the realm of the dead, the realm of departed spirits, the place of temporary holding and punishment until after the great white throne judgment when all those who inhabit Hades and hell at the present time will be picked up and thrown into the lake of fire, joining the Antichrist, his prophet, and Satan and all the demonic spirits. That's the reality of what happens to every person who dies without saving faith in Jesus Christ. One in paradise where Jesus went after he was buried. It's called Abraham's bosom. Jesus went there, descended into the lower earthly regions after he was buried and emptied out paradise and took everyone who was there into heaven with him after he was risen from the grave. Not going to get into the theology of it. I want to get into the practical reality of it. These two men represent the reality for every single living person on planet Earth. You will spend eternity in one of two places. You will either spend it in heaven with Jesus Christ, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit, and all of those who have put their faith and trust in Him, or you will spend eternity in hell, eternally separated from God, from the goodness of God. A few months ago, I preached a sermon called Good Morning, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it's serious. It's supposed to be. It's sobering. It's supposed to be. Because it's true. I preached a message in June called The Straight and Narrow and I preached about the only way that would get you into heaven, which was through Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell you, every other road that doesn't lead to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will eventually wind its way into the depths of hell. I don't care how fun it is. I don't care how rich and lavish it is. I don't care how feel good and politically correct it is. Every single 
path in life and opportunity in life that does not end with Jesus Christ as Lord will end in hell. And remember, many times in Scripture, Jesus told people that called him Lord that they were going to go there. You know, this guy in this story says, Father Abraham, you know, the only father that can save you is Almighty God. Religion is great, but religion in and of itself doesn't save you. Only relationship with Jesus Christ. In that sermon, straight and narrow, I'm not going to re-preach it. I'm just going to cite the same survey that I cited in that sermon where 72% of Americans believed in heaven, while only 58% of the same exact people said they believe in hell. Hell is a very misunderstood place and perhaps most misunderstood by Christians. There are some that say hell simply does not exist. There are some that believe that if hell does exist, it's only there for really, really bad people like Adolf Hitler or serial killers or rapists. Some people think hell will be a never-ending party with all of their friends. I was listening to a conservative news program uh, just a couple nights ago, and the host was talking about socially conservative values, and he mentioned hell three times in his program. The first time, he was talking about a joke, and he said that that joke was as funny as hell, is what he said. The second time he mentioned hell, he was talking about a group of people that he had watched at a restaurant, and he said that that group of people were as happy as hell. And then when he's talking about a serious social issue, he told his audience that he was as serious as hell. Well, which one is it? Because it can't be all three. And it, in fact, is not two of the three. Hell ain't happy. Hell ain't funny. But you better believe it's serious. I was watching baseball tonight on ESPN. I saw the manager commenting on his commenting on his pitcher's performance. Pitcher pitched an amazing game. And he said, oh, he pitched a hell of a game. When someone really, really scares you, if you're honest, you will look at them and say, you scared the hell out of me. Well, I hope I can do that literally this morning. A song that hit the billboard charts and has been played at every single redneck funeral I've been at the last 18 months. Sing, sings by a, a really effeminate sounding guy named Hardy. I cannot stand this guy and I cannot stand this song. He says, give heaven some hell. I'd love to have a conversation with that young man. If I got to drive to Nashville with Drew Pace, I'd like to corner this guy and say, hey, buddy, guess what? That's impossible. You can't give heaven any hell. And guess what? You can't hide your beer and your moonshine in heaven either. That's what the song says. Hell's become a byword. It's become a PG cuss word. Right? That's an acceptable cuss word. You can say hell if, if, if you don't want to say any, any really, really bad words. Of course, none of you. I'm just, I'll just talk about myself. That's the one I use. Even in the church, in the church, we talk about hell in, in hushed tones, like it's a forbidden family secret, like we don't want anyone to really know about it or, or we're ashamed of it or we're we're quiet. Don't let anybody. Let's just talk about, let's talk about the good stuff. Let's talk about grace and let's talk about mercy and let's talk about love. But for God's sake, please don't tell anybody about hell. The fact is Jesus pre preached frequently and openly and specifically many, many times about hell. Many preachers have said Jesus talked more about hell than he talked about heaven. I haven't tallied it up. I don't know if I necessarily believe that or not. But I know that Jesus talked emphatically about it a lot. And he taught the true realities of hell. Real talk about the reality of hell. Reality number one. Hell is a place of torment. Hell is a place of torment. In this passage, the word torment is used twice. And the word agony is used twice. Twice. Now, I don't know about you, that does not sound like a fun party place to me. Hell is a place of pain. This rich man who, according to verse 19, would dress in purple and fine linen and feast lavishly every day. He was perfectly conscious and aware in the pit of hell. One thing seen right off in the story. The rich man couldn't buy his way into heaven and he couldn't buy his way out of hell. He was there. Awake, fully alive, and fully experiencing hell's torment. 
And Jesus uses the rich man as an example to get the Pharisees' attention because in Luke 6, 14, Jesus says the Pharisees were lovers of money. And he's talking about you can't be lovers of God and money. You can't serve both God and money. Jesus is not picking on rich people. He's not saying that all rich people go to hell. He's not saying that all poor people go to heaven. He's using two people to contrast. And he's trying to get the Pharisees to wake up and realize the reason you're on this earth is for eternal purposes and to store up treasure in the kingdom of God. That's why he uses this specific example. You can be rich, poor, white, black. You can be from any side of the social spectrum. You can be from both sides of the tracks. If you don't know Jesus Christ, at the end of your life, you will experience the torment of hell. This man felt heightened pain. He saw... Lazarus being comforted. I bet this rich man thought about every time he strolled through his gates on his way to his lazy boy recliner and his plush carpet and his beautifully furnished house and his lavish parties. I bet while he's sitting there in the torment and pain of hell, he thought about every time he passed Lazarus by. I'm sure he thought about every time he had gone to the synagogue. I'm sure he thought about every time he, was, he, 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 he heard about the, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. The people in hell will have an eternity to be reminded that they are receiving the, 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 the recompense, the payment for their decision. Nobody in hell will question whether or not they belong there. They will know. And they will feel that pain. This man spoke, he saw, he cried, he begged for relief, and he felt. He was fully conscious. You need to know that the soul and the spirit have senses, and they can feel pain. Hell is a place of heightened desire with no fulfillment. Imagine the alcoholic going through withdrawal and never getting another drop to satisfy his thirst. Imagine the greedy longing for wealth and possessions and never being able to buy or sell again. Imagine the lustful never getting another ounce of gratification. That is the reality of hell. And this man cried out for mercy and he didn't receive any. Wow, how the tables had turned. He had every chance to bless, to bless Lazarus and repent and use his wealth for the kingdom of God. He ignored the opportunity. It is not human, humanly possible to comprehend the full biblical description of hell. Nothing on earth can compare to it. There's no nightmare that could produce a terror to match the terror of hell. There's no horror movie that can describe and, and make you feel the fear. There's no crime scene with all its blood and gore that could match the horror of hell. People in hell will see it. They will smell it. They will breathe it. They will hear it. And they will feel it. That's the reality. It'll be beyond anything humanly imaginable. The Bible describes it as weeping in Matthew 8, wailing in Matthew 13, gnashing of teeth in Matthew 13, utter darkness in Matthew 25, flames in Luke 16, burning in Isaiah 33, torments in Luke chapter 16 again. And Jesus says in Matthew 25, 41, depart from me, you who are cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell was prepared as a place of punishment for Satan and the demons that rebelled against God with him when they were cast out of heaven. That's where and why hell was created. It was a place of punishment for them. Matthew 13, 42. Jesus says he will cast the unbelieving into the furnace of fire and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Any person I have ever seen touch something really hot. You know what they do immediately afterwards? They gnash their teeth. They go to pick up the, the grill and they accidentally touch the bottom and they go. Shh. They go and they, they, they're they trying to get something out of the fire pit or they put their hand on the stove or you touch the cast iron skillet without the hot, without the hot plate or without the hot glove or the mitten. And you go. Shh. Mm. And you gnash your teeth. It's, it's the reaction that the body does when you're experiencing pain that goes beyond your nerve endings ability to process it. Gnashing of teeth. It's what people do when they really hate someone and they can't stand someone and they get really angry at them and they see them and they think about them and they just start gnashing their teeth. The Bible says that is the expression of the soul that experiences the torment of hell. That's reality number one. Reality number two 
is hell is a place of eternal separation. There's a lot of teaching that says that hell is on earth, that it is only temporary, that that no human being will go there. But the Bible says here in verse 25, the rich man's eternal destiny was decided. There was no changing it. He lost all power of choice. It does not sound a place like you want to ask someone to reserve you a spot by the air conditioner. Verse 26, Abraham tells him, there is a great chasm fixed between us and you. No one can leave there and come here, and we cannot leave here and go there. The point is, there are no exits in hell. There is no exit. And hell isn't a place on earth. It's not a metaphor for hard times. It is a place of eternal separation from all the goodness of God. All who enter hell abandon all hope. Jesus said, Matthew 25, 41, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into eternal fire. And again in verse 46, they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will enter into eternal life. In Revelation 14, verse 11, it says that the smoke of the torment from hell ascends up forever and ever, and there is no rest day or night. Daniel 12, 2 says many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake some to eternal life, and some to etern- eternal shame and contempt. Revelation 20.10 says that the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented there forever. 2 Thessalonians 1.9, those who don't know Christ and who torment the righteous on earth will pay the penalty of eternal destruction from the Lord's presence and from his glorious strength hell is a place of eternal separation real life forever forever and ever and ever so my question is why would you want to enjoy the temporary pleasures of sin at the risk of eternal separation from god in hell and my question for every believer is why are you afraid to have to endure temporary ridicule or temporary rejection when what is at stake is eternal separation from God. Hell is a place of torment. And hell is a place of eternal separation. Is anybody in this house ready for some good news? Nobody. Okay. I, well, I'll keep, I'll keep preaching you hell and damnation. Fine. Have it your way. Reality number three about hell is you don't have to go there. You don't have to go there. There was no time for the rich man or for his brothers, but the good news this morning is there is still time for you. Jesus Christ went to the cross and descended into hell and came back up and rose from the dead and ascended into heaven so that you don't have to go to hell. That's why he came and why he died. Romans chapter 3, verses 23 through 26. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We usually say that verse and move on, right? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You want to hear what verse 24 says? It says that those are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus because God presented him as a payment for sin through faith in his blood to demonstrate his righteousness because God in his restraint passed over the sins that had been previously committed and God presented Christ to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be righteous and declare those who have faith in Jesus as righteous. The wages of sin, thank you, Micah, the wages of sin are death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you see what makes the good news so good? You see why it's important not to tiptoe around hell? Why you can't sweep sin under the rug? Why you can't sweep eternity under the rug? Why you can't let people stroll through life? without giving any thought or inclination to the things of God, and yet still come in church on a Sunday morning and go to a Sunday school class, and you're just as lost as the hooker on the street corner because you have no relationship with Jesus Christ. Sitting here don't save you. The good news is, we're talking about somebody here that can and that will. And his name is Jesus Christ. He is that man of sorrows 
that we sang about. The Bible says Jesus was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, that the Lord smite him and struck him, and that it pleased the Father to bruise him. Why? Because all of our sins were laid on him. Because we all, like sheep, have gone astray, and each one of us has turned to our own way. But the Lord laid the iniquity of all of us on the back of Jesus Christ. And now my debt is paid. Amen. You better have more assurance than a baptism certificate. You better have a real relationship with Jesus Christ. You better know him. And more importantly, he had better know you. He had better know you. Does he know you? You've been talking to him. You've been praying to him. You've been following him. You've been obeying him. You've been telling other people about him. Saving faith results in faithfulness. Romans 6, and 23. But now since you have been liberated from sin. Oh, I love that. Since you have been liberated from sin and have become enslaved to God, you have your fruit which results in sanctification and the end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let me go to the back of the book, Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 through 8. It says, Then I heard a voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will no longer exist. Grief Crying and pain will no longer exist because the previous things have passed away. Then the one seated on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. He also said, right, because these words are faithful and true. I'm going to put these last three verses up on the screen for you right now. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Look at this. I will give water as a gift to the thirsty from the spring of life. The victor will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. And nine times out of ten, every time you hear this read at a funeral, the preacher stops right there at verse 7. But that doesn't complete the thought. you got to read verse 8. Because it says, But the cowards... The unbelievers, I love how cowards are mentioned first. But the cowards, unbelievers, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, sort all the sexually immoral now, not just the ones who commit different sexual sins than you do. That word sexual immorality is the Greek word pornea, where we get the word pornography. That, that, that's included. Adultery included. Sex outside of marriage included. Homosexuality included. Lesbianism included. Every single letter in the LGB plus included. But they're all included. Every single one of them. Even the ones I struggle with. Even the ones you struggle with. The sorcerers. The word there is where we get the word pharmaceutical. It, it's talking about drug users and drug abusers. Idolaters and all liars. Their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. That's, that's the reality of heaven and hell. Jonathan Edwards said this. He said, this world is the only hell a true Christian will ever have to experience. But it's also the only heaven every non-Christian will ever experience. My question for you, when this life ends... And it will. Do you know where your soul is going to go? And if you don't, I don't care who sees you. I don't care if somebody took a picture of you walking down the aisle and put it on Facebook. So what? So what? You need to get right with God? Get out of your seat. And take the first step of faith today. Because that will result in an eternity filled with faith. 
I'm not trying to belittle, listen to me, please hear my heart. I'm not trying to belittle or invalidate anyone's pain or suffering or abuse on this earth. But the good news is, is when you put your hope in Jesus Christ, and in, in put your hope in Jesus Christ, any pain or suffering or abuse is temporary. It's temporary. And there is a heaven that is more beautiful, more majestic, more marvelous than anyone can imagine on earth. Your mind can't even comprehend. If God was to show you a glimpse of his eternal glory, your head would just explode. I mean, like the emoji, just... We can't comprehend it. But I'm telling you, you want to go there. And hell is so horrible, so horrific, so torturous, so destructive, so demeaning, so corrosive and abusive. You do not want to go. And Jesus, came, Jesus Christ came to save you so that you don't have to. You realize a poll was taken? Why are you so passionate about this, Pastor Dave? Well, Jesus was passionate about it. You know, a recent poll was taken in the Catholic Church. And, that poll, and I'm not just picking on Catholics, because Baptists can be just as complacent as Catholics. And there's some genuine Catholics. Don't, don't hear me wrong. But the poll said that climate change for the people that were polled climate change was a more pressing issue than the authority of scripture and the reality of eternal hell climate change you think it's getting hot here you you ain't seen nothing yet it's going to get hotter the bible says that this earth in its present form greenhouse gas exemption Notwithstanding, the earth in its present form is passing away. And that this earth will melt with fervent heat. Just like when you light a candle and it begins to melt and you see the wax drip down the side. That is the future for this planet. Today is the day. If you do not know Jesus Christ... And you have an ounce, an inkling of doubt. You, just, you might be saved and you might be struggling and you just need to be reassured. I don't care. Today is the day you come. And when we sing about that man of sorrows, you get that assurance of the Holy Spirit in your heart. You cry out, hallelujah, praise and honor to the King. Amen? I want the worship team to come. If you're here, that's Jesus calling right now. If you're here or you're watching today and you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you may know him as a religious leader. You may know him as a, as a Hebrew teacher, as a prophet. You may know him in a lot of ways. If you don't know him as Lord and Savior, don't wake any longer. Take the warning from the rich man. Do you realize that the most passionate prayer that was ever prayed in all of Scripture, look at me, don't look at them, look at me. The most passionate prayer that was prayed in all of Scripture was prayed from hell, and it was prayed one day too late. Do you realize that? It was prayed one day too late. Good news is today, you can call on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. If you're not saved, today is your day. Now, if you are saved, and I know a lot of you are, our goal is to be able to say what the Apostle Paul said in Acts chapter 20, verses 26 through 27. Paul said, I testify to you today that I am innocent of everyone's blood because I did not shrink back from declaring the whole Word of God. Can you say that? Can you sit here in this church building right now and say, I'm free from everyone's blood because I have not withheld the whole truth from anyone I know? If you can't say that today, when we say amen, and after you leave Sunday school, you got a job to do. The reality of hell is that it's a terrible, eternal place of torment. The good news is Jesus Christ went and came back and rose and ascended so that you don't have to go. As we sing about what Jesus did for us, let's let that have its impact. Amen. Let's stand together.
We pray, Lord, that you would remind us throughout this day, if we have not accepted the grace of the blood of the cross, that today is the day because we don't know about tomorrow. Let today be someone's day, Father. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Hello, my name is Dave, and I'm the pastor here at Antioch Baptist Church. I just want to thank you for joining us for this time of praise and worship. I hope that it impacted your life and that it inspired you to take your relationship with God to the next level. If you were watching today and you felt convicted by the Lord to accept Christ as Savior and Lord of your life, I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. Just say, Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. I need you to make me new. I invite you into my life to be my Lord and to be my master. I believe that you rose from the dead and I believe that you are the Son of God and I believe that you will return to the earth again to take me home to be with you. Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for dying for my sin. I receive you now as my Lord and Savior. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and if you responded to this message today, we'd love to hear about it. I want you to contact us here at the church and let us know about the impact that it's had on your life so that we can celebrate with you and so that we can give you some resources to help you in furthering your walk with Jesus. Thank you so much for tuning in. God bless you. And remember to love, connect, go, and grow. To Jesus for the cleansing power. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood?